don't know what time it is. We're good on time, so we'll try to be considerate uh, because of kind of the icy conditions out there. How many of you have frozen pipes as we speak? Anybody? Okay, no, so it's just me then? Go on. We, you know, is that? Go on, Pat. Yes, yeah, I was going to mention it, that's right. Dawn had something on Facebook that her pipes froze. <clears throat> you, know, you know when you have a week that's just full of one rough thing after another? And then that week turns into a couple weeks of just one rough difficulty after another. And then the two weeks turn into a month. And before you know it, you're like, okay, God, whatever it is you're trying to teach me, I got it, right? So we were, we were feeling a little bit of that this week. I gotta, I'll be honest with you. I got to be honest with you. And I ask you to pray for us, you know, pray for, um, pray for encouragement. And, and we're good, you know, nobody's panicking or anything. But we had a lot of things happen one after another. This difficulty, that difficulty, this financial thing, and, and that blockade, and this problem. And then our pipes froze. And it's like, okay, we get it, God. We get it. You're messing with us. And that's okay because our heart's still at peace. Uh, but do keep us in prayer. It's cold and, and pipes do freeze and things go bad. But at the end of the day, our faith and our peace and our joy uh, is in the Lord. And we want to maintain that. And we want to talk this morning about when God writes your love story, right? That's been our theme. Um, two weeks ago, we began that. We talked about uh, when God writes your love story. And uh, this week, we'll be continuing with Ruth chapter 2 mostly in becoming a person worth Pursuing is what we're going to be talking about today. Next week, we're going to talk about maintaining purity, maintaining purity, and that's for single people, and that's for married people, and that's for spiritual things, and it's for physical things, maintaining purity. So please don't talk yourself out of being here next Sunday, because it is for all of us, okay? Um, so maintaining purity. And then the first week in March, we'll end this series with marriage and divine purpose, right? And once again, that's for the married and the singles. But today, this morning's text is out of Ruth. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 23. I know it's a lot, but once again, I just want to read it and get it in our heart and kind of get it permeating, and we'll repeat some of the scripture. If you want to take a note, write this down. Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 to 23. I would encourage every one of you in here, maybe you're married, maybe you're in a relationship, maybe you're not in a relationship yet, praying in that direction. I don't know, wherever you are. I would encourage you, read the book of Ruth thoroughly because it is so full that in a year of preaching out of it you would not get all that's in there the book of ruth gives us an example of personality traits for relationships it's about romance it's about spiritual uh, romance really it's about how god loves us it's about the personality traits that ruth has that boaz has that naomi has it is no there's no end of the richness in this book so for me to share for about 40 minutes on any given Sunday doesn't touch the surface. And I really want to encourage you. Uh, folks, you know the series that we're doing, and I want to encourage you. When we do get into a series, work it into your devotional time. Work it into your devotional time. That'll do a couple different things. It will allow the Word of God to permeate your heart, right? And then when you're here on a Sunday or a Wednesday or what have you, and I'm reading the Scripture or I'm sharing something, it'll, it'll, it'll go ding in your heart because you've been reading it. And it'll make sense to you, and it'll get in your spirit, and that's what we want, right? We want to be on the same page. So this morning, let's just begin to read there. Ruth chapter 2, verse 1 to 23. Ruth meets Boaz in the grain field. Well, I, last I checked, not a real popular date spot, you know, Starbucks, grain field. Not quite the same, but that's what we're doing right now. And that's what's happening here. This is our first date, so to speak. We'll get to that in a minute. But verse 1, now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing of great wealth from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and pick up leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes, in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi says to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. And as it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, and the Lord bless you. They answered back to him. He's the boss, right? Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters after he told them, Lord bless you, uh, who does that young woman belong to? And the overseer replied, she's the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please, she told us, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. And she came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So, so verse eight, so Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, Listen to me, don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting, and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, and because she's a widow. Just keep that in mind. 
And that was a possibility. I've told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. Verse 10. At this time she bowed down with her face to the ground and she asked him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you would notice me, a foreigner? Now stay with me. I know we have a bunch more verses to go. Just hang in there and listen to the story here. Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. Verse 12, may the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. And you have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At, me at mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here. I have some bread and dip it in the wine, dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, they offered her, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. Right? As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to the men, let her gather among the sheaves, don't reprimand, don't reprimand her, even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up, and don't rebuke her. Ruth gleaned in the field until evening, worked all day, and then she threshed the barley she'd gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah, or 30 to 50 pounds, roughly. Uh, or 20-something liters. 18, verse 18. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough from that previous meal. Verse 19. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Right? And the idea here is, what, where did you get all this? Right? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The, man, the name of the man I work with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead, she added. That man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Verse 21, then Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, stay with my workers until they finished harvesting all my grain. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It'll be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. Verse 23, And so Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Now next week when we preach, we'll continue on with the book of Ruth. But for today, today I just want to do a little recap of what we've been talking about. Right? I know it was a lot of scripture, but it just reads like a story. And this is why I want you to read it real slow on your own time. Go home and read this real slow. And start looking at Ruth and what she says and what she does and how she does it and how Bo Boaz reacts and what Boaz says and how Ruth reacts to that. Read this. Read this. It's full, full of richness. So she puts her, she, 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 Ruth has put her story, right? And God writes her love story. She's put her story in the hands of God. She's chosen to travel with her mother-in-law, turn her back on where she came from. Right? And travel with her mother-in-law and commit herself to the one true God that she understands who, who this is. Through relationship, she's come to commit to the Lord God. And she just continually allows God to do what he wants to do in her, in her demeanor and the things that she says. In both Ruth and Boaz, if you pick them apart, there's way more characteristics that we can share today. So I just picked out a handful of them, right? To be a person worth pursuing. And you see these character and you see the characteristics in them of someone that pleases God. It's the type of person that, that God is happy with. And some of this some of this is going to teach us what to look for and what we should strive to be, right? Some of this message some of this message is for those who are are in a dating pool, who are looking for someone. And, and what, what you should be for someone to pursue you and what you should be looking for to pursue them. Some of that will be about this. And, and, and that goes for the marriage as well. What we are in, in my marriage. Am I a husband that pleases my wife that is, is worth pursuing? Or does she wake up, up in the morning thinking, what have I done 13 years ago or however many years ago it was? I think it's 14 years ago. I don't know. Don't tell her that. Anyway, I'm not sure. Some, somewhere in there. Um, and so even if we're married here today, a wife, a husband, are we worth pursuing? Are we doing the right things? Do we see these personality traits within our relationship, within ourself, right? And then the other part of what this is going to show us today is not just the dating scene and the marriage scene and the romantic as it relates to man and wife, but it relates to as God, how God treats us and the love that Christ has for us. Because as we'll see in a little bit, Boaz being this kindred redeemer, we'll talk about that in a second, right? A close relative. We, he's a type. He's a type of someone. And we'll get there. We'll get there. 
All right, so if you're dating, looking at someone, waiting for, waiting for that someone special, uh, if you're married, either way, this, this is for us. This is for us. Marriage, marriage, as we know from the Word of God, is a picture. It's a picture of Christ's relationship to the church and to me, right? And when we look at Ruth of Boaz, we'll see that some of that design worked in. So some quick questions just to get us thinking. Just to get us thinking, some quick questions. What qualities, what qualities do you think most single people today would look for in a spouse? Just rhetorical. Rhetorical. It's rhetorical. Just, you know, think it through. What qualities do you think most people are looking for? Not, not necessarily yourself, but what are they looking for? What qualities make for a good spouse, right? And now you might be thinking of a TV show or a book you read or your upbringing, the way your parents raised you. I don't know. It depends. It depends what your world looks like is what's going to define what qualities you're looking for, right? How is... And the question would be, how does your list of qualities, of what to look for, how does it compare with the people around you that you know, with the rest of the world? Your list of requirements in who you're looking for, if you think about it, do you think, is my list any different than my friends or the people that are outside of this church or the people that are inside of this church? What's my list of requirements that I want in a spouse slash date, right? What are the qualities that you appreciate? about your spouse. Did they change since you've been married? The qualities that you appreciated way back when, for those of you who are married, did they change? What you liked about your husband, what you liked about your wife? Very interesting dynamic here. Many times I'll have a conversation with people and they'll come into my office for counseling or whether it's, whether it's because there's a problem or just because they're saying, you know, we, we just feel like we, we, we could use a little help, a, a little encouragement, right? And, uh, and they'll come in and they'll talk to me and, and they'll say, well, you know, my, my wife just won't stop talking. <laughs> and I'm so tired. And, well, and, but later on, we'll discuss, you know, what drew you to your wife? Well, she was so talkative and so friendly and so cheery. <laughs> Things change. You understand what I'm saying? My husband, he, he was such a hard worker, and that just drew me to him. He's so good with people. He's so kind-hearted to everyone around him. And then years later, he's never home. He's always out helping someone. You understand how dynamics change? So the question here is the personality traits that we're after, the things that we're looking for, are they temporal or are they permanent? Let me, let me be a little clearer about what I'm saying right now. Is your list of requirements for somebody that you would date or even in your own marriage relationship, is what you require of that person, it is, a, is it a steadfast trait or is it something that changes and ebbs and flows? Let me give you an example of each. An example of something that might change would be that, oh, he's so helpful, she's so helpful, she's got, she's got time for everybody but me, right? Uh, but something that doesn't change would be she's faithful, he's faithful. That doesn't change. That doesn't ebb and flow. You get it? So I guess what I'm saying is when you sit down and write your list of requirements, is it blonde hair and blue eyes, which is kind of shallow? Or is it the kind of thing that you would say, this is a permanent requirement in this person? He loves the Lord, and he's not going to change. He's faithful. He's loyal. Yeah. Th there's a big difference between those, those, uh, those traits that the world tells us, hey, here's what you ought to look for. Let me tell you something, folks. It just came out. I think it came out this weekend. And I saw people post on, uh, on Facebook all over. Probably some of you already know where I'm going with this. It came out on Facebook, a movie that recently came out, right? And it, and it kind of colors the way that we think. And maybe you might think to yourself, well, I, I'm not going to go see the movie. Or some, some of you read the book or whatever. And I'm talking about Fifty Shades of Grey, in case you're wondering. You know what, folks? That thing, that thing is soft core pornography. It is not something that the Christian community ought to be going to see or read or have anything to do with. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not saying let's get on a soapbox. Let's get out there on Facebook and start bashing the movie. I don't care, to be honest with you. My prayer is that God would touch people's heart, right? So I'm not going to pick one thing to fight because it's so many, it's so, it's so much more than that. This is just one, this is just one more movie. In fact, it, it surprises me that uh, the Christian community would kind of be shocked by a movie like this when there's so much other filth and garbage out there. But, but what I'm saying, the reason I'm saying it is because your world and the media and where we live today, we're surrounded by what makes people think the way that they think. And the, and the things that we watch and the things that we hear, it colors our ideas. 
So then when you sit down to write the list we just talked about, when you sit down to write the list of requirements, you have to be very careful that your heart hasn't been influenced by everyone and everything around you. You have to be very careful that your heart and your requirements aren't, aren't, aren't being set by what's around you, but that they're being set by your relationship to the Lord and what we know in the Word. That's where our requirements should come from. That's where our personality traits should come from. So let's move on. Right away, we want to get into this, and we'll, we'll, we'll ask some more of these questions, and we'll delve into this a little bit more, uh, God willing, this Wednesday. We'll see how that goes, uh, weather-wise. But for now, let's start talking about Boaz, because thus far, we've talked only about Naomi and Ruth. And now we're going to talk about uh, Boaz. Now, Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, uh, a man of great wealth. It says he's of great standing, great wealth, depends on your version that you're reading, of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And we're told he was his relative, and his lineage is traced back to Perez, son of Judah. And as a relative, he qualifies as this, quote-unquote, kinsman redeemer. What that means is he's a relative close enough to rescue Ruth. He's a relative close enough that if somebody's husband dies, they can marry that person and sort of bring them into their household to protect them and also to continue the lineage of the man, right, of, of who passed away, who died, who's died. And, and this is one of those uh, types of person, persons in Boaz. This is one of those types of persons who is a type of Christ. Why, why do you say that? Well, because Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He is, he's the relative that God sent to rescue me. Get it? There's, there's a connection there. And I, I love this about this story. I love it. it the, the kinsman redeemer. The law that God wrote into the people of Israel way back then in Leviticus, right? The Levitical law that set up a kinsman redeemer for the people was so that, that God would protect the widow. But when, God was, but when God was designing this frame, when God was designing this picture, he already knew this is a smaller part of the bigger picture when I send my son to be everyone's kinsman redeemer. I love that. I love how God does that. How the Old Testament and the New Testament mesh. They don't argue. They don't conflict. They're not separate. Please be very careful when you read the Word of God, when you do your devotions. Not, don't stay out of the Old Testament. Read it. Read it. Study it. Look into it. If something confuses you, look into it more. Don't look into it less. I, 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 it, it disappoints me when people stay out of the Old Testament because, oh, it's hard to understand. Or I don't like, I don't think it's fitting for today. Hogwash. The picture of the New Testament is laid out in the Old Testament. And so this kinsman redeemer is all about that. So we're also told that, let's go back to Boaz. He's a man of great wealth, a man of great standing. So he, he, he possesses a bunch of fine qualities, okay? He's a, he's a man of means, which would technically mean to a woman at that time, he's a good catch, right? And, and I think that we know at this point, uh, I think that we know at this point, that you know, if you're looking for somebody, you want to make sure that they're responsible and they're and they're well off. And I think that's a, a fairly a fairly dependable thing to look for in a person. And um, so I think there's so as we as we look at Boaz, uh, just know that God has sent them to remember the trip that they took, remember the trip that Naomi and Ruth have taken, and and just look at what God did and who where He led them to, and He led them to somebody who was well off, who was responsible who had means, who works hard, who does the right things. But let's talk about here, I want to start on my character traits. And the first character trait I want to talk about this morning is that is Ruth's. And in that, she has a caring heart of a provider. Ruth has the caring heart of a provider. Now, I know that men are, biblically speaking, the breadwinner sometimes. The word talks about a man being responsible to take care of his family. In fact, a man who can't take care of his family, the Bible describes him as, as worse than an infidel. So men, get busy. You have to have, I don't, I don't care what the hours are, but you got to have a job and you have to have a responsibility. But it's more than that. It's more than that. What it is, is it's the heart of a man to want to take care of his family, right? Not just to feed them today, but to feed them and to invest for them and to make sure one day, you know, I love this about my family. I'll just bring this out a little bit. My parents have never had a lot of money. They've never had a lot of money. We've never had a lot of beans. We've always been taken care of. You knew that grow, you, I've shared before, growing up, we had nothing, right? We have very, very little. Always fed, always clothed, thank God. God has been good to us. But, uh, but we, we didn't have a lot. 
But even, even when we didn't have a lot, they were thinking and talking and arranging and saying, how do we leave something for our four kids? At the time, I didn't think anything of it. But now I look back and think, wow, you know, they've always had that at the back of their mind, that they wanted to take care of us, provide for us, and even provide for our future. And that's a good thing. I don't understand it. I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. I don't understand it. When I talk to someone and they're like, hey, you're 18. You know, you're, you're on your own. I'm not, I don't have to help you anymore. Here, look, look here, understand me. Understand me. If, if a son or a daughter is going through something, they're having some problems. There's addictions. I, please don't misunderstand. I'm not suggesting you're a crutch to your child. We all want them to stand on their own two feet. You want to take care of them, right? And, and I get that. We're not talking about enabling a, ch a son or a daughter. We're not talking about that. I'm not talking about allowing a son or a daughter take advantage of you or, 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 or do things that are inappropriate, right? But, it, but it, at some point, as a parent, it should be ingrained in here to say, I want to take care of my child. You know, I, I've already warned Julian, I'm going to be hugging and kissing him when he's 17, high school. I don't care. I don't care who's watching. I've already warned him. I say, be prepared to be embarrassed. He's my son. Jaden's my son. I don't, I don't really care what it looks like. I'm going to love on them till, till I draw my last breath, right? And I'm going to provide for them until I draw my last breath. Now, if one day my son's had a problem and I realized, hey, hey, bud, I love you, but I'm going to cut you off financially because I want you to stand on your own two feet. You're having some problems. That's okay. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking the principle, that heart principle that says, this is my blood and I'm going to do whatever I need to do to take care of them. You get, you get me? There's a lot of complications in there. I know, I get it, right? But the principle, the, that providing nature, that spirit of, of love and of nurture, that ought to be ingrained in a parent. And that ought to be ingrained in whoever you find that you're looking for, the heart of a provider, the heart of a caregiver, right? It ought to be in there. And let me show you how, how Ruth shows this. In chapter two, verses two to three, and Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after one in whose sight I might, I might find favor. Ruth is a widow and she's a foreigner, but she's got Naomi to take care of and she's got Naomi to worry about. There's, there's not safety for a widow in this environment. That's why Boaz wants to protect her. That's why Naomi's talking about, be careful, stay with the women, because she's in peril, but she still has this heart. I committed to Naomi, and I'm gonna take care of her. That's a really sweet thing, that's a special thing. So for those of you who are dating, that's something you need. And for those of you who are married, you better be providing that to the other person, both female and male, that heart of providing, that heart of care, that heart that says, you know what? I wanna do whatever I can to make sure that I'm nurturing and providing and doing that, right? And of course, uh, Naomi says to her, go my daughter. So she departs and went and gleaned, etc. And she says, and Ruth says, uh, let, let me get out of here and be busy. Let me go, I've committed to her and I'm gonna do it. Even if it's not a safe venture, her heart is to provide. And God's law made that possible. God's law made that possible. Now I'm about to say something that's a little touchy. So I'm, I'm hoping that nobody gets offended in here today. Uh, and I'm praying that, the, the, but, but I know that what the Spirit put in my heart. So I'm praying that you just take this the right way. But see here, see here in God's mercy, foreigners, widows, and the poor. That's what this law was instituted for. God set up this law in Leviticus chapter 19. You can look it up if you want to. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. And it says in those verses that reapers of the harvest, right? People that would go out into the field, they're reaping the harvest. They were supposed to leave the corners of the field unreaped, right? The, the grain is still there. And in fact, the stuff that would fall from what they were reaping was also fair game. And who was it for? It was for foreigners, widows, and the poor. That's what God put that law in place for, to protect them, to provide for them, those people who didn't have connection, who didn't have family, who might have come from Moab, right? So that nobody went empty-handed. So here's the question for us today, just this little tidbit. How do you feel about foreigners? Mm. It's awfully quiet in here. Mm. Now look, I, 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 I know we live in a weird political, we live in a weird society. We live in a weird atmosphere. I'm Italian, I was born in Germany. But I'll tell you something, and this is no offense, where's, where's my brother Ron? There's no offense to Germans. <laughs> I, I love Germany and I, I love Germans. But you know, Italians were very much third-rate citizens in Germany. We were the underclass. So we felt that, we knew that. We knew that we were the have-nots, we knew that. And my parents worked hard, but I'll tell you, walking down the street, you would get some looks down their snoots at you because all oh, these Italians are all coming into this country and taking our jobs. 
ooh, does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Except now it's maybe not Italians and Germans. Now it's the Italians who are looking down their snoots maybe, right? I'm talking to myself. And so uh, why am I bringing this up now? Well, because we have to be very careful what opinions we form. We have to be very careful what platforms we stand on, right? Because if God himself said, here's a law that I'm putting in place so that the foreigners and the widows and the poor are protected and taken care of, who am I, who am I to dispel that? Who am I to think a different way? Now, I know there's, there's injustices in every way. I get it. I'm not trying to say, you know, this is not a political statement. This is just a little principle. It's just a little nugget in Leviticus that made me say, ooh, this is good. It's good, right? God put laws into place to provide and love the widows and the poor and the foreigner. Amen. So moving on. So here is Ruth, right? She's a Gentile. And not only is she a Gentile, she's from Moab. She's a Moabitess. And the people from Moab was a descendant of a drunken union, right? With, and we won't get into that whole story, but Moab is the enemy of the Jewish people. They fought them coming out of, uh, coming out of Egypt. Moab, Moab is, is pretty much the bottom rung. And here's Ruth, and she's Moabite, right? And uh, so there she is in the field, happens to belong to Boaz, right? Don't you love coincidences? I don't believe in coincidences. I never have. But anyway, moving on. Thousands of fields to choose from, and she just happened to stumble into Boaz's. But God knew what he was leading, and, uh, and God knew how to lead her to the right guy. God knew how to lead her to the right guy. God knows how to lead you to the right guy. God knows how to lead you to the right girl. Those of you who are married, you say, well, that ship has sailed. That's okay. We can still work on it. We can still work on it. That's what this is about. Ruth is a love story. We've talked about this before. It's kind of a, it's kind of a how-to, both for finding a mate and for knowing how to live with a mate. And, of course, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about how God relates to us in a bit. But God is still in this business. God is still in the business of drawing people and leading them and directing them to the right place at the right time. Remember Naomi's despair? Remember Naomi's despair? Oh, woe is me. Just kill me now. Right? Leave me. There's no hope for you here. Right? But God knew exactly what he was doing. So don't despair. Don't despair. Right? Ruth is a woman, secondly, of graciousness. She's a woman of graciousness, of kind of a meekness of heart. But don't misunderstand. I'm not, talking about, uh, I'm not talking about grace being forgiveness right now. I'm talking about she has a gracious demeanor. Do you know what that means? Somebody who's sort of meek. Somebody who's considerate. They're, they're, it's not really the word kind. It's just something about them. that uh, it's, it's the opposite of arrogance is what it is. It's not even the word humble necessarily. But there's just a graciousness to Ruth. Verse, chapter 2, verse 4 to 7 says this. Now behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, said to the reapers, May the Lord be with you. And they said to him, May the Lord bless you. And then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reaper, Whose young woman is this? And the servant in charge of the reaper answered and said, She's a young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from Moab, etc. And she said to us, Please let me glean. Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. She didn't have to tell them, please let me glean. She's a foreigner. She's allowed. She actually had a right to walk into the field and do her thing. But instead, she still approaches them and she says, and she says, can I glean? Can I do this? Can I, is it okay for me to glean? There's a graciousness there and not this weird sense of entitlement that we all seem to have, even spiritually. Even spiritually, I know God is good to us. And God gives us a great many gifts. But I'm not going to go to God and start demanding things and start claiming things willy-nilly. Oh, I, I, I know it's very popular today and, and I'm, I don't want to talk about name it, claim it, and this and that. I don't want to go too far off path here. But the truth is, when you go to God with a gracious heart, gracious heart, knowing God has good things for you, and you say, God, is it your will? Do you choose to do this for me? Do you choose to? There's a graciousness in there that Ruth has that I love. So, she's, so this is her first meeting. This is her first meeting with Boaz and Ruth, and Ruth, right? And we get this glimpse of Ruth's character, that she's acting kindly and being gracious and doing this. And Boaz hears, like, he sees this demeanor, and right away violins start playing. Boaz is already enticed. He's already, he's already like, who is she again? He's asking the overseer, he's like, who's that? And obviously that means something. And then he hears what the overseer says that she did, and he's like, oh, no. These are personalities. This is not, guys, please read Ruth at home. Write it down. You can, you can literally see what's going on in Boaz's heart and in his head. And, and yes, God led him there, but you can literally see what's happening. Everything Ruth does, he's like, 
wow. Like, you can see it. Warm fuzzies are like, you know, fireworks are going off. And you can see it. As I mentioned, uh, under God's law, Ruth had a right to be there, but she asked. And I think it moved Boaz. She didn't enforce her right, but she came meekly. And here's, here's the thing for, for those who are not married right now. You know what? Arrogance, pride, we can get that confused for confidence. And confidence can look attractive for a season. For a season, confidence can look attractive. But when you look under the surface sometimes, that confidence can read arrogance, pride. You don't need that. You don't want that. You don't need that. You don't want that. Don't pursue it. Don't put it on your list. Okay, moving on. If you're ever going to know, uh, if we're ever going to know the Lord uh, the way that we need to, we need to approach him with that same heart, with that same heart that goes before him graciously. Lord, we need you. But will, will, you, will you do for me uh, on, based on your will? Because I don't deserve it. I don't merit it. But just a graciousness that's there that I really like. Amen. Moving on. So King James Bible says this. And it just, in keeping with what I'm saying here, the King James Bible in this version uh, says this, but as for me, I will come into, David says this, as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy, right? And in thy fear, or another version would say, I'll come into the holy place with reverence. There's this reverence that Ruth has. And maybe that's another good uh, synonym for, uh, for graciousness that she's got, right? This is another good way to describe what does it mean that she's gracious. She's got this reverence that she carries with her, right? And that's a, a sweet thing. And we, you don't come into the Lord's presence with anything but it, uh, uh, but that reverence again, you know? This is important. It's, it's a point that I feel like we need to make because we kind of live in an atmosphere in a society that says, well, you go before God, you claim what's yours. You do so. You do so very carefully and cautiously and with reverence and with gratitude and all of that. Amen. You know, you can be very prideful when approaching God. You can be very prideful when approaching God and you're in trouble if we are. Okay, moving on. Right. I'm about to go a little fortune cookie on you here. Listen, I think that it can all be boiled down to this theme. I think it can be boiled down to the throne of grace is open. Because I don't want to offend anybody here today saying, well, we know what we've been promised. Yep, we have. The throne of grace is open and available to those who see that grace, right, is the only way open for us to come. Did you catch, did you get that? Okay, you didn't. I have, I have about 50 blank looks. The throne of grace is just that. It's free. But it's free to me if I understand as I approach, this is a gift, not an entitlement. Amen. Better? Okay, moving on. I once read a commentary once, getting back to Boaz here. Where, where Boaz is reacting to this. And I read, I read this thing, the commentary, this is kind of what put this in my head, uh, that a very, very loose translation this is, where, where Boaz is saying, when he's asking the overseer, who is this, right? Where it's as almost as if he's saying, why have I not seen her here before if we're related, right? And he's got this interest and it's peak, and, uh, and, God, and, God, and let God write. Let God, if he's writing our story, which I pray that he is, let God write this meekness, this graciousness into our personality. Young men, look for that. Look for that graciousness. Look for that meekness. Amen? And women, same thing in a man. Okay, moving on. I think I've been plenty clear. This grace that Ruth exhibits here, what happens was when Ruth comes across this way, when Ruth comes across this way in this kind of meek, gracious way, what happens is it makes Boaz's heart flutter, right? It, in, it, it endears her to him. And when it endears her to him, he gets this, he gets, it fosters this heart of protection he wants to do for her. How many of you know that warm, fuzzy place when you first began to know your, your significant other, your special loved one here? How many of you remember that? You just, you just had all this warm, fuzzy sense of, I want to take care of them. I want to protect them. I just remember getting married and we'd be on the phone and we're sitting on the phone and we're like, let's just stay up all night on the phone. Let's just, you know, we'll just, it's, I know we're not together, but maybe we could just stay awake on the And then like a couple years later, I'm like, honey, I'm just not a phone talker. I don't have time for this. Like, but, but let's go back to that initial warm, fuzzy feeling, right? That's what it's engendering in Boaz. Ruth's demeanor, her personality, is engendering in Boaz this warm, fuzzy, fuzzy feeling, right? Verse 8 and 9. Verses 8 and 9 of chapter 2. Then Boaz said to Ruth, listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go glean in another field. Furthermore, 
Don't go, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my mates. Let your eyes be on the field that they reap and go after them. Indeed, I have commanded the servants not to touch you. When you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink from what the servants draw. Now, it wouldn't have been easy because she's a widow, like I said. It's not easy for Ruth to do this. She, she had to have a little courage to go in there. And even with all the grace and all the meekness, she still had to have some guts to say, I I'm going to ask. I need to do this. So there she is. is because it could be dangerous, right? And she had no reason, uh, but she's given no reason to fear. Boaz kind of approaches her, finds her. She's saying things that make his heart go pitter-patter. And he's saying, you know what? Don't worry. Don't be afraid. And, and it gives her an understanding. Oh, I'm safe. I'm safe. You know, everything I'm saying this morning, I was reading through it last night and I'm like, it's a little vague, but it's really not. Because when you're in a relationship, God will give you wisdom to say, this is the right thing. He will. Or, I just don't think this is the right thing. But you got to look for it. You got to ask God for it. You got to ask God for that wisdom. Amen? That's for the singles. Anyway, so here's this, here's this reaction of Boaz, one of protection and also provision, right? And, and the way she's acting is making his heart go out to her and all of that. Uh, but he has this one command for her. He has this one thing that he needs to tell her. As much as I'm taking care of you, stay with me. I'm, I'm doing this for you. I'm taking care of you. I'm sorry. God is just putting on my heart. That's really important, folks. I'm, I have to tell you what God is saying. I don't know who this is for. God has just spoken to my heart right now and said, Please make clear, the person that you're with has to provide for you. They have to take care of you. I'm not talking about dollars and cents. I'm talking about they have to have a heart to want to provide for you. Tuck that away. God spoke it to my heart right now. Write it down. We'll put it on Facebook later. God has to, God has to, find, God has to find you somebody that's going to provide for you and love you and take care of you with the spirit of providing for you. Male, female, doesn't matter. It's just this understanding that they need to be responsible. I'll move on from there. Whoever that's for, just tuck it away. So didn't, uh, you know, and, and the truth is, God, God has illustrated this to us as well. He provides for us. He does this. And remember Naomi? Let's go back to her for a moment. Remember Naomi? She had to learn this the hard way. She had to learn this the hard way. She was in Moab and she's panicking. And of course, um, you know, they, they never should have gone to Moab, uh, but they weren't trusting in God to provide for them. And that's how they landed in this mess. But, but Ruth is single-minded and she's dedicated, first to Naomi and then to God. And so then Boaz tells her, hey, you know what? The, the only thing I want to tell you to do is to stay here. All I'm going to tell you to do is you, you have to stay in this field. Now, at this point, Ruth could have said, you know, Ruth could have stood up and felt a little indignant about this. You know, I asked and I have a right to be here. And now you're telling me to stay in this field. Um, she could get offended that he's bossy. You know, she tells him, you can't tell me what to do, whatever. She could, she could have all of that. But that's not who Ruth is. Again, folks who are looking for someone and folks who are married. It's not who Ruth is. It's not in her demeanor to stand up and say, you can't tell me what to do. It's not in her persona. It's not. She still has that meek gracious, humble, kind heart. That's what you need to be, and that's what you need to find. Moving on. So she's still being gracious and humble. And another characteristic that I want to point out now is gratitude. Ruth is grateful. She's grateful. Chapter 2, verse 10, she fell at her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? And like I said before, like I said before, she's not just a foreigner, she's a Moabite. That's like the lowest of the low in their, in, their, in their environment, in their ancestry, because of Lot who was drunk and his older daughter. She, he, she, Moab is the result of this incestuous thing. Moab, Moab is really the lowest of the low in terms of culture and in terms of who they are. So she could very well, she could very well wonder why is Boaz being so nice to me as a foreigner? But he is. And she's grateful. She's not upset that he's telling her, stay in this field. That's all I'm telling you to do. That's all I'm asking you to do. Do what you got to do, but stay here. She's not upset by that. Why was he being so kind? Well, a couple of reasons. In the natural, I think Boaz just fell in love with her. I think Boaz sees her demeanor. He sees how she acts. You know, 
I, I, I don't know what Ruth looks like. I like to think that she must have been relatively attractive for him to be attracted to her, and he falls in love with her. He's smitten. And so this is in the physical now. But in the spiritual, remember what I said earlier? This is a picture of romance. But it's also a picture of God's love for us. It's also a picture of God's love for us. God, I'm a foreigner. Why me? You with me? Understand? God, I'm a foreigner. I don't deserve grace. I don't deserve mercy. I didn't deserve to be saved. And yet you, and yet you, you gave it. You gave forgiveness. And you gave mercy. And you brought me into this relationship. And that's exactly the picture that Boaz is painting here for Ruth. Foreigner or not, he's accepting her, right? When was the last time you poured out your heart in gratitude? That's the personality trait we're on right now. When was the last time you just got before God and just thank him for everything? You know, uh, of course, you're, you, you, have the, you have every right to ask God for what, for what you need. But I said before, we, we don't go before God with rights. We go graciously. But when was the last time you got before God and just began to thank him for, for what he has done, for who he is, for where you are today? Every breath you have is a gift from God. And I don't know, I don't know when my last day will be, but, but God does, right? My days are numbered. Each day, I have reason to say, thank you. Thank you, Lord. And then when my breath stops, I still thank him. Why? Because I'll be with him. My gratitude should have no end. None. And this is Ruth's demeanor. She's there. She's not looking for anything. She's, not, she's, she's asked to be just able to glean a little bit. She even says, I don't know if you remember earlier in the scripture, I'm not even as high as one of your servants. Gratitude. Gratitude. Do we have it? Do we have it? Sure you want that in a relationship uh, with your spouse, with your wife, with your husband. Folks, husband, wife, listen, when was the last time you thanked them? When was the last time gratitude was a part of who you are? When did you last really get with your, with your spouse and say, you know what? Things may not be perfect, but I'm so grateful to have you. I'm so thankful. I many times look at Andrea. Many times I think, whew, where would I be without Andrea? Nowhere good, I'll tell you. Truth. I would have been a terrible single person. Terrible. I'd have been a mess. I'd be eating the wrong things, up at the wrong time, awake at the, you know, sleeping at the wrong, I'll, I'd be a disaster without a wife and two children. And, I, and I'm grateful for that. When was the last time you spoke to your spouse and said, you know what? God knew exactly what he was doing. Even those of you who have problems in marriage, even those of you who might come to a place in your marriage where you think, God, did I make a mistake? Ah, uh, no, 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 no. God is a restorer of unions. When you stood before God, listen to me very carefully. When you stood before God and you said, I do, those of you who are married, the rest of you just hang on. When you said, I do, God saw that, and God acknowledges that union. He acknowledged that union. And the two of you became one in God's eyes. It's what the word says, two became one. So for me to look back and say, well, maybe I just married the wrong person. Maybe I just did the wrong thing, says that God is not able to make two one. And he already told you he did. So he can, if he made you one, which he did, he set up marriage. Marriage is not the world's uh, device. It's God's. And when you got married, as difficult as it might be, as hard as it may be, as harsh as the things may have gotten, know this, God can still make it one. He still can. I shared this little nugget yesterday or the night before at the Valentine's dinner. And what it is is there is uh, a lot of counseling in this nation. 80%, 80% of all analytical counseling, clinical counseling, is marriage counseling. What does that tell you? It tells you that no matter how good a marriage is, every marriage has conflict and struggles and growth and things you've got to grow past and things you've got to get beyond. You understand what I'm telling you? So why did I bring that up when we're talking about gratitude? Because a fantastic way of diffusing problems in a marriage is to say, you know what? I see your good qualities. I see your good qualities, and I'm thankful for them. The word of God is not lying when it says what? A kind word turns away wrath. 
So much could be fixed with one little attitude adjustment that says, God, I'm grateful to you and I'm grateful for my spouse. No matter what's going on, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Move, let's move on. So she is a grateful person and that's a personality trait that I want. In per How many of you have ever given somebody like a really, really nice gift? Really like a nice gift. And they're like, oh, thanks. <laughs> I, doesn't it tick you off? Isn't it, isn't it upsetting? <laughs> like, and so who are we? Who are we to say to God, not just for his relationship, but even for a spouse? The word of God says that he who finds a wife finds what? A good thing. It's a gift. Some of you are like, yeah, I'd like to re-gift mine. No, no, no. Wrong attitude. Folks, God can fix it. God can do this. Stop laughing. It's not that funny. Those of you who are laughing, stop re-gifting your spouse. So, so listen, gratitude. It'll change you. It'll change you. Put gratitude in every relationship you've got. Your employee might be on your last nerve. God, thank you that I've got this guy. He, at least he's here. At least whatever. And, and just begin to, and, and maybe look for positive things in that relationship and start talking to people in gratitude. It will change you. It will change you. The next character trait here is kindness. Just that base, base kindness. Single people, single people, if a, pro, if a prospective date if a prospective date, somebody that you're seeing, isn't kind and respectful to his family or her family and their friends, I guarantee you the day will come where that's aimed at you. Amen. I guarantee it. Why? Because when you first meet someone, it's all fluffy. It's all butterflies, right? It's all, let me put my best foot forward. You, you've heard the adage, you've heard these cliches, you know, how does he treat his mother? Well, there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of truth in that. How do people relate with their family? It's a big deal. Now, some of you are in here thinking, all right, well, maybe I don't have the best relationship with my family, but you're, you're killing me here. Listen, in our relationships, in our relationships, I'm trying to, I try not to look at particular, you know, these subjects are really hard to preach. They're very hard to preach. Can I tell you what, can I just share something with you real quick? I have to avoid looking in a particular section when I say something and your face goes, like you're not actually doing that, but close. And that makes me have to be very careful about where I'm looking because I don't want anyone thinking that I'm talking about you. So moving on, gratitude. Let's just move on from there. Pursuing kindness, right? We're talking, oh no, right. We're talking about kindness here. And we're talking, about, uh, we're talking about seeing how a prospective date, husband, wife, a prospective person that you might spend the rest of your life with, are they kind? Are they kind to the people around them? That's part of who they are. It's part of who they are. All right, moving on. And, and I want to read where that is here. So Ruth continued, right? Ruth, at the end of our previous verse that we just read, said, why have I found favor in your, eye, in, in your sight? And here he's answering it, verses 11 and 13 chapter 2 verse 11 and 13 and Boaz answered and said to her all that you have done for your mother-in-law after the death of your husband has been reported to me stop right there for a moment she intrigued him so he looked into who she was she hears what she he hears what she's about and she pursued and he pursues her you know you need to do the same thing those of you who are not married or single, or you're single, you're maybe young, whatever, you need to be very careful what you do and who you pursue and why. And there's nothing wrong, I'm not saying become a stalker. I'm just saying there's nothing wrong with you seeing, seeing what they say. I, I did confess this to you when I first started to work here. When, I first, when God first led me to be here in this church, and, I, and God laid on my heart all this love for you guys. And he did. He really did. Before we knew you, God had given me all this love for you. And, I, and it was so bizarre to me that I had so much love for people I didn't even know yet. But there it was. And I did confess. I warned you. I said, I'm a stalker. If you're on Facebook, you're fair game. <laughs> Why? Because it tells me where you are. It helps me, it helps me know where your heart is. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, I'm not lurking in your bushes. I, I just, I think it's important if you're going to go after somebody that you, you need to know who they are very, very carefully. Young man, young lady, you're important. You need to have a little bit of, you need to be, you have, a, you have to have a little bit of self-preservation. You're worth it. You're worth a lot. You don't need somebody that's not going to be right to you. Moving on. Okay. So he sees this and, and Boaz says, 
Uh, all that you've done for your mother-in-law, I've seen it. The death of your husband, it's been, fully, it's been fully reported to me. And how you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth. And you came to a people that you did not previously know. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord. He sees it. He has heard what she's done. He approves of it. He appreciates what she's saying. And, 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 and showing that gratitude and that kindness toward her by just saying this. By saying, I've seen what you did. I saw what, you, what type of person you are. And I want you to know, God bless you for that. And now she's seeing him, right? This, it's romance. This is like this is how it works. She's getting to know him. He's getting to know her. And all of the personality traits that are illustrated here kind of say this is the right thing. This is the right thing, folks. I'm tired of talking with people that that they're they're they maybe want to be together. They maybe don't. Maybe they're young. Maybe they're a little young, and they and they're going to date the wrong person. And I see it, and they. They kind of say, you know, well, you know, maybe it's the right girl or maybe it's the right guy. And I'm seeing red flags everywhere, red flags everywhere and thinking, aren't you worried about him with this? Aren't you worried about her with that? Is this not a concern? For, have you prayed about this? Isn't, this? isn't this a problem for anybody but me in the room? Right. This is the way it's supposed to look. They're talking. Things are getting revealed. The warm fuzzies are there, right? But it's not all emotion because he knows what she's about. He looked into it. Understand what I'm saying? It's cerebral too. Love is not an emotion. We know this. It's part emotion, but it's decision. It's decision. It's commitment. It's something that you choose to do. We've talked about this before. Sometimes you wake up full of warm butterflies and you just want to hug your spouse and not let them out the door. And other times you're like, will you just let me, just leave me alone for a moment? Now, never, I never feel that way. I never, ever feel that way. But, I mean, sometimes you do. Why? Because love is a commitment. It's a decision. It's something you chose to do. And you don't choose to undo it. Moving on. Then she said, all right, and this is what he's saying. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full of the Lord. And I love this. Love this. What this engenders in Ruth. The response that she gives, right? So he's saying, I know what you've done. May the Lord reward your work and your wages be full from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to seek refuge. And now here's her response. And I, I have to envision her looking like Essie Mae. From, like, right, with a, maybe she's batting her eyelids. And, and it might be a southern accent. I, I'm not sure. I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and indeed have spoken kindly to you. I know I sound like a Muppet. Try, try, in gen, like, envision what I'm envisioning. I'm just envisioning this woman I'm just envisioning Ruth who's like wow he's being really nice to me and she's responding back she might as well have a parasol in my head it's like I don't know I don't know I'm not sure why it's going southern in my head I guess that's just a picture I've got but it, she's moved by his the fact that he's moved so he sees her he knows what she's done he's moved by it he's responding in kindness she hears that now she's moved you get it romance okay let me just read it <laughs> in normal voice, I have found favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me, and indeed you've spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I'm not like one of your maidservants. I'm not even I'm not even up to the par of one of your servants. I'm not even a worker here. And that puts her under, under, foreigner, not even a worker, not even a servant, which could only be somebody he hired and paid and trusted, right? She's like, I'm not even one of those. And there's all this kindness, right? And what you discover about Boaz, and he knows all about Ruth, and, and, and I just love that. I love what, what we're seeing. He knew her heart. He sees his heart. And again, it comes back to what we are with Christ, that, that Jesus does that, right? Jesus knows who I am already. He looked into who I am. He knows you, and he loves you anyway. His warmth, his grace, his love for you is, he, he knows all about you. He knows all about you, all of what you've done. Also, two other little nuggets that I want to point out right here. It shows us something that Ruth does not do. It shows us something that Ruth does not do. And again, it goes back to that whole idea of you don't need somebody prideful or somebody arrogant or somebody who's, who's, who's kind of full of themselves to be, to be clear. right? It shows us that, that it, it, with Ruth, it's not necessary to blow your own horn to blow your own trumpet, to break your arm, patting yourself on the back, put it any way you want to, right? You know people like this. They're sort of self-flattering. And, and when, you, when you run into somebody self-flattering, okay, all right, that's great. Good bully for you, right? It's a turnoff. I'm just going to be clear. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to be very, very clear. It's a turnoff. There's a cockiness in there that it's uncomfortable. It's unsatisfactory. You don't need to do it. You don't need to do that with God. You don't need to do it with man. Well, why don't you do it before God? Because we do this. 
We do this. We get in prayer. We get on our knees, or we even at an altar time, or 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 at a, at a you know at, we're talking to somebody, and we sort of do nothing but talk about me and what I can do and what I've done and all of my abilities and what God's gifted me with and me me me. And you can be spiritual and self-flattering at the same time, and it's not necessary. Why is it not necessary for God? Well, because He's already entirely aware of all that you do, and He'll reward you at the right time. But if you reward yourself, that's it. That's your reward. Okay, moving on. And obviously not before people, because people can see it. People aren't dumb. They're not. Folks, you want to date? You want to date someone? Don't go in there with like, I'm really good at this, and I'm really good at this, and I'm really good at that, and I'm really good at this. Because before that date's over, they're going to be like, and you're really alone. You're all by yourself. You know, and, and that's just it's something that I read into it. So I just, isn't it refreshing? Isn't it refreshing when you see people who do things behind the scenes? They don't, they don't care who knows, right? They don't need the accolades. They're just, they're just good people. They work hard. They do things. They don't need a lot of, and we have those here, and I'm grateful for them. I am. I'm grateful for them. You don't need to toot your own horn, basically, is what I'm saying. You know, Ruth, Ruth is describing herself in a way that's, I, I'm lower than low, but I'm grateful for how you're treating me. You know, he, she's not saying, well, you know, uh, I have a right to be. She never, she never once said anything that would say she's not anything but a humble person. And that's important. That's Ruth, right? Humble, kind. She has a desire to satisfy as we come in for landing here. At mealtime, Boaz, he has actually a desire to satisfy her. Again, this is a reaction that he's got that's engendered in his heart from who she is. He just wants to take care of her. Right, come here that you may eat of the bread, dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. She, he invites her to dinner, right? Uh, they've only met once and he's already asking her out on a date. So he's moving pretty quick. So she ate, she's satisfied, has some left over. This is the first time, again, any, I have to describe what this means for Christ. Christ invites us to meet with him. Christ invites us to eat with him. Not to do or be anything other than a person that recognizes, I need grace. I need Christ in my life. I need to be forgiven. And then Jesus says, well, then come and eat. Right? The word of God says what? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? So that, 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 that whole exchange, that whole exchange where Boaz is calling Ruth and saying, sit, eat, be full, be satisfied. You have leftovers, take them home. That's what Christ wants for you. That's what Christ wants for me. Some of us aren't really looking for a relationship right now, and, and our marriage is, is pretty good the way it is. Don't, don't fix it if it's not broken. All right, well, at least let God speak to your heart this morning with this, because he is speaking to your heart. He, you know, God wants to feed you. He wants to take care of you. He wants to sustain you. He does. And, and the question then would be, are you satisfied with Jesus? Are you satisfied? Is it enough? Do you get that he's calling you? By grace, he's calling you into his presence, taste and see that I'm good, and I want to feed you, and I want you to be satisfied. I want your life to be better with me in it, and it will be, because that's what God does. That's what God does. And then generosity, in verse 21 and verse 23, then Ruth the Moabitess said, furthermore, he said to me, you should stay close to my servants until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it's good that you go out with his maids, lest others fall upon you in another field. So she stayed close by the maids of Boaz in order to glean, until the end of the barley harvest and the wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. And this, this last point here in the chapter is even, it's, it, it's a, a fantastic position, right, that Boaz puts her in. Not only, not only he's saying, yes, you can glean in my field, but he's telling his servants, drop stuff on purpose. Get all you want, you know. And, and an ephah of uh, wheat or grit that she's collecting here is about 30 to 40 pounds. 30, 40, 50 pounds, depending on whose translation you read, right? Or 22 liters of food that he's giving her. She doesn't, she, and, and this is what Christ does for us. This is what Christ has done for us. She didn't plant it. She didn't work the field. She didn't do anything in it. But she gets there, and Boaz, Christ, like Christ, like kindred redeemer, and Boaz says, just take it. Just take the blessing. Take the fruit. It's what Christ has done for you and I. So yes, this is about relationship, but this is also about God's relationship with us. And it's also, also about what Jesus is doing with us and, and wooing us, for lack of a better word. That Jesus takes care of us and wants to bless you. And, and it's not something that I have to do. I don't jump through hoops to gain his blessings. I have to be faithful, yes. I have to be faithful, yes. I have to stay in the field, right? Didn't he tell her that? I have to stay in the field. I have to stay where... And, and he also tells her, keep your eyes on this field, right? Keep your eyes on this field. 
And later, next week, when we talk, you'll, we'll, hear, we'll hear a little bit more about that. We'll read a little bit more about that, something I want to point out. But that goodness of God, that faithfulness of God that wants to give you nothing but more, nothing but generosity, right? That's the same thing, even in, in, again, in a relationship. You know, I, you, you want to be with people that are giving, that are givers, that are like that by heart, by nature. The book of Ruth is, like I said before, it's so full. It's so full of traits that we can't go over them all. We can't go over half of them. There's so many things in the book of Ruth, if you keep looking at what they say and when and how, you realize it, it's, it's, you could literally write 40, 50 different personality traits that you can see in Ruth and Boaz as to this is what our relationship should look like. This is what our relationship to the Lord should look like. Singles, seek God. Look for the right attributes. Look for the right thing. You know, for those of us who are married, let's, let's don't get desensitized. Some of us need to rekindle those marriage vows. Some of us here are married. But what I'm saying today is kind of making stuff churn in you because you realize, I haven't really done this. I haven't really done this. Our relationship's not really like this. And it needs to be. It needs to be. You know, we're going to end uh, the service today. We're not going to. We're not going to end. Uh, you know, we're not going to end it slow. We're going to end it. I want to end it on an up oh, note, Michael. Maybe you could play something back there. Just you know, put something on when we're when we're done here in a couple minutes. Uh, but I want to encourage you, folks. If you're married and you realize, hey, maybe we're not in the right place. Maybe I haven't done this. Come talk to someone. Come talk to somebody. Come meet with me. Uh, you know, there's there, every every relationship needs a little health sometimes. It's a good and healthy thing. It's not a bad thing to be encouraged. Amen. And uh, speaking of getting, and I don't want you to be desensitized in that wedding relationship. And speaking of that, Andrea shared a little joke with me yesterday about, uh, about getting desensitized in marriage. And I, I guess this is how she sees it. So she says, marriage is like a deck of cards. In the beginning, all you need is two hearts and a diamond. But by the end, you wish you had a club and a spade. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, honey. I, I appreciated that. You shared that with me. I love my wife. You know, I, I love my wife so much that I have changed since we've been married. There's been, there have been things that have happened in our relationship that make me realize, wow, I really do love my wife. Something very dear to me, you know, happened and I, that I had, and I was just a possession, no big deal. But if you're in this section of the room, like right here in these first three rows, actually, uh, Mike, I think it's right where you're at, right? Uh, check your seat, will you? Will you check under your seat? Uh, some time ago, I, I, you know, I have always liked, I've always liked German cars, and, and I, I've always... Um, you know, God allowed me to, to be gifted with something, and, um, and my wife did something, and, and she came home with a little part of it. And this is all I had left of one of my dearest possessions. This is all that was left, right here. See? This is all, this is all it is. If you can't see what it is, it's just a, a little decimated piece of, of license plate from my, from my car, my baby, that I was taking care of, that I really liked a lot. But, but I'm married now. <laughs> But I'm married now, and it's not important, and it's just a thing. So when this came home, I thought, okay, well, that's good that you're okay, honey. And I, I did battle a little bit. I'll be honest with you, I battled a little bit with, oh, I'm unhappy, but she's okay. Oh, I'm unhappy, I'm so unhappy, but she's okay, and that's all that matters, but I'm so unhappy. And I, I, really, I really struggled, but you know what? At the end of the day, at the end of the day, genuinely, I said to myself, Honestly, I must be in love with this woman because I should have been much more upset. And I wasn't. I wasn't. Look, folks, here's, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, here's the thing. The picture of Ruth, what we can gain from it, it, it will change you. It will change your marriage and it will change who you're looking for. It will change who you're looking for. I want to be very, very clear, folks, those of you who are single, who are looking, um, look for faithful people. Look for faithful people. That's who Ruth was. That's who Boaz was. They were godly, faithful people. I don't know what they looked like. I don't know if they were, you know, I don't know if they were picture perfect or anything like that. I, I don't know. But don't let your standards, don't let your standards be shallow. Don't let your standards be superficial. Find the right thing, folks. Find the right thing. Because if you don't, if you don't allow God to set your standard for you, the time will come where those things that didn't matter will matter so much. And those things that did matter won't matter at all. Red flags, double standards, unequally yoked. God gives us so much warning, so much wisdom in how we ought to do what we do when it comes to relationship. But we're going to pray. We're going to wrap up uh, for today. And I just want to encourage you, please, folks, read the book of Ruth. Get a pencil and a notebook and start writing down little personality traits next to them. 
And when you see one that you like, when you see one that you like that, that calls out to you, tell your wife, tell your husband, you know what? You have this. I love this about you. I love this about you. Even, even if you are having, you know, even if you are having trouble, you should find at least one. <laughs> you should find at least one or two and find those good things about your spouse. Read through the book of Ruth. Read, read what Jesus has done for us. Amen? And let that soak in and saturate. Will you stand with me today? Hallelujah. Father, we, we, we know that there's too much information in, in Ruth for us to even process. It's too much information for us to even gain in one sitting. Uh, but we are so grateful that you put that story in Scripture so that we could learn from it, so that we could be blessed by it. Father, our hearts are, are so grateful today for what uh, Jesus has done for us. And we pray that uh, you would continue in, to engender in us a gratitude for that, a love for that. Make us people of gentleness, people of kindness, O oh God. People of encouragement, Lord, with hearts that want to care and provide and protect. Make us like that, God. We ask, Father God, that you would help us to, to have, uh, have our blinders removed. Help us to look at those areas in our life that we need to address. And we thank you, Lord God, for our spouse today. Uh, in this room, God, we thank you for our spouses. No matter what we're going through, Lord, we, we offer to you gratitude today that you are the God uh, of unions and you're the God who put us together and, and allowed us to be one when we made that decision. And I do pray, Father, all over this room and, and in this church, even people who aren't here, that your spirit uh, would knit our marriages together, that you'd knit our hearts together with our spouses. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. I know it was a lot of material, detailed, etc. But Wednesday, uh, we'll, we'll have some questions. And I really want to talk about this. It's all about relationships.